Good afternoon, Anatole. Good afternoon. Okay, Anatole, so you have your new book out right now. It's, it's on Pakistan. Can you show us the cover? Very, very good. Which date is the official launch? Or was the official launch? Uh, the 12th of April. Okay, all right. Now, in the book, you take a, a little bit of a different slant from what we've normally seen, and you say that Pakistan's biggest problem is not what we normally read, meaning militancy, meaning um, the growth of the, uh, the Pakistani Taliban in the Punjab, trouble with the ISI, with Afghanistan. What do you say it is? Water, in the long run. I mean, in the short to medium term, I mean, <laughs> these other problems are really serious. Uh, but in my view, uh, unless something really terrible happens, Pakistan will survive the present insurgency and militancy. Uh, but unless it can do something about its water situation uh, and its birth rate, which is the other side of that, of course, um, it will be facing really serious water shortages a few decades down the line. And that, by the way, is before one factors in any possible changes uh, as a result of climate change. And um, are you talking about Pakistan in isolation, or is this a regional problem over there? It's a regional problem, but Pakistan is, is worst hit, <clears throat> both because, uh, with the exception of Afghanistan, of course, it's the most naturally arid country of the region. I mean, most of Pakistan, uh, b before the British began the Great Irrigation Schemes, uh, was semi-desert or dry scrubland. Uh, it's also true, though, that Pakistan is the most wasteful user of water in the region, which is really saying something, by the way. Um, but its rates of, of, rain, of rainwater harvesting are well below India's or Sri Lanka's or Bangladesh. Um, so uh, for all these reasons, um, together, as I say, with a hugely expanding population, uh, Pakistan is the most endangered country. Okay. Now, uh, you've been watching Pakistan for a very long time. I first met you in Pakistan in 1988. Mm -hmm. So um, um, you're not dismissing the the the, uh, the role of or the the place of the militancy of the of the of the long um, the long history of the finance of fundamentalists and militant groups as a problem for the country. Are you? Oh no, no, of course not. I mean, this whole book is set against the background, of course, of the rise of militancy insurgency in Pakistan, the war in Afghanistan, and so forth. But, you know, I wanted the book to last. I mean, I'd, I'd like the, the book, you know, still to be referred to um, many years from now. And so I also wanted to look, you know, further into the future as well. And not just the future. I mean, water shortages are already an acute problem hmm. in parts of the country. Um, and, of course, I mean, Pakistan has an ongoing, um, very vicious and bloody war with the insurgents, uh, which I, I would say it is winning. I mean, I, I was up on up in Swat on this visit, and I mean, the, the army has driven out the, the Taliban and restored order there. But of course, much of Fatah is still out of control. Terrorism is now a universal problem in Pakistan. That's much more difficult to stop, of course. Uh, and in addition, um, there is uh, the war in neighboring Afghanistan and the very, shall we say, equivocal role uh, of the Pakistani military and uh, inter-services intelligence in that war. Hmm. Uh, um, how do you define survival? You said in response to the first question, Pakistan is going to survive the problems that we're seeing right now. The long-term problem is water. What does survival mean? Well, I think, you know, we've both been in places that, if you like, did not survive as states. Afghanistan in the 90s was one of them. Chechnya in the late 90s was another one, where basically you know, the organized framework of state institutions simply collapsed, and you were left with warlords, um, militias, bandit groups, tribes, you know, what have you, but no state as such. Somalia, another case. Yemen, perhaps, going in the same direction. Pakistan is still far removed from that. Uh, bits of the state work okay just about when it comes to continuing to operate. One bit of the state actually 
is pretty effective, and that's the army. And the army is capable of defeating rebellion. I mean, the Pakistani army is not the army of a failed state. It's a powerful army. Um, it's, in some ways, of course, too powerful for the country's good, mm. uh, in part because it's been able to get so much money, a disproportionate amount of money from the state. But the Pakistani military doesn't resemble in the slightest um, you know, the kind of previous Afghan militias or Somali tribes and militias or Chechens or whatever. I mean, this is you know, a modern organized armed force. Is there the potential? Now, we just have in the last two days, we have the news that the ISI has asked the CIA to halt the drone program. Uh, one, I mean, I, I'd like to hear you know, what you think about that, what would be the impact in Fatah of halting that. And then the second thing is a, a longer range question, and that would be um, quite apart from there being a rebellion that could take over the government, couldn't you have a situation where the philosophies of the Pakistan t Taliban simply become embraced and accepted by the army? That becomes the, ru the rule of law. On the, the second point, no, I don't think so, uh, because the army is now pretty he highly motivated in fighting against the, the Pakistani Taliban. Um, after all, these people are rebels. Uh, they have murdered military prisoners, beheaded them, you know, on camera, um, and the army has fought against them very hard. I mean, th there is a, a, an element of, you know, Islamization, if you will, in the military. But the other thing is that the military is absolutely categorically opposed to people forming sects, you know, or sectarian groups within the military. Because the one thing that they hate is the idea of the military being divided along, you know, the only loyalty within the military should be to the military. And from what I gather, I mean, military intelligence, which is a counter subversion agency basically within the military, has been pretty effective in stopping that. So unless something like, for example, an American invasion of Fatah was simply to push you know, military loyalty over the edge, I don't see that as a, as a major threat. And in society, um, you, know, you have, uh, of course, very devout Muslim traditions, notably the Barelvis, who are at the same time um, very strongly opposed to, to Islamist revolution. Um, so I think... You know that that is um, that threat has has been to a degree exaggerated. Okay, and then oops, you know I didn't turn off my own phone. I'm going to do that right now. Uh, what about the first uh, the first part of the question regarding the uh, uh, the uh, drones? The, oh the... yes. Well, if the drone attacks do cease, it will certainly lower the temperature in Fata and lower the degree of anger with the United States and with Pakistan as the ally of the United States. Um, so from that point of view, things will get better. On the other hand, of course, I mean, the drone attacks, the drone strategy has been followed uh, because the American military believed, with good reason, that it was killing a lot of Taliban commanders, you see. Yeah. Um, now, so the question on the other hand is, if you stop the drone, tr drone strikes, will this reduce much of the real pressure on the Taliban and therefore reduce the possibility that the Taliban may you know, be, be willing to consider some compromise peace deal. Um, it's, well, we'll have to see. It's, it's difficult to say on that one. And, the, and then the, the concern uh, whether that also puts pressure on any al-Qaeda al, al that's based in that region and whether it's reconstituting itself or will uh, without the pressure of, of the drones? Yes, I mean, my own view is that, well, two things. One is that the shelter that the Pakistani military have given applies to the Afghan Taliban, not to al-Qaeda. They did crack down hard on al-Qaeda in the past, um, and uh, I'm sure they wouldn't allow al-Qaeda openly to start you know, creating camps and so forth, because they know very well that, that that would be monstrously provocative to the United States and that if, God forbid, there's another major terrorist attack on the United States, you know, it could really bring the roof down on Pakistan.
Pakistan. It could, it could lead to America destroying Pakistan. So I don't think they'll do that. But in addition, you see, <coughs> I'm not myself convinced, like a number of other experts, that the old top leadership of, of al-Qaeda, in other words, bin Laden, if he's still alive, Zawahiri, and so forth, are any longer of such critical importance. Um, because what we've seen is now that major terrorist threats to the, to the West can come from a whole number of different places. Uh, they can come from within the West itself. They can come from Yemen, which is emerging as a very great potential threat, al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, from Somalia, from North Africa, and so forth. In other words, you know, as people say Al Qaeda has metastasized, you know, set up franchise operations. And while getting bin Laden and Zawahiri would be a tremendous morale booster for the US, I'm not convinced that it would have any effect, any at least any great effect, on the plans, for example, of Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula to attack the West. Mm. Okay. Um, and then closing out. Um, what what is the you mu you're definitely going to be asked this question often while you're here? What is your policy advice for the U.S.? I would explore the possibility of a peace settlement with Mullah Omar and the Taliban leadership. I wouldn't necessarily do that immediately. I think. Peace building measures have to be put in place. The Taliban has to be allowed to get to um, create a, a legitimate office somewhere, for example, in a Gulf state. Um, on, but once you know you have an address to go to to talk to the Taliban, you can begin to explore what terms they would in fact accept for a settlement. And it may be that the whole thing is impossible, but we won't know un until we've actually talked to the top leadership. If a United States administration adopts this approach, then immediately Pakistan turns to a considerable extent from a problem into an asset, because only Pakistan can mediate you know, a peace deal with the top Taliban leadership. Only Pakistan can push them, you know, use its influence to push them into a settlement. It would still have to be a settlement that they can accept, I mean, and they will never accept a permanent presence of US troops. But you see what I mean? Pakistan then becomes an asset. Yeah. Again, not not a problem. So, I mean, my my views on this are based, I mean, in part, you know, on the basis of my own previous travels in the Pashtun areas of Afghanistan, um, in a conviction that it is highly unlikely that we will, in fact, be able to extend the effective writ of the government in Kabul to the Pashtun countryside. Um, that, in effect, this will remain an out-of-control area uh, for the foreseeable future, and that, therefore, we should try to get the best deal we can, because otherwise we'll be back to a situation we both remember very well, which is essentially 1989 to, to 1992, when the Soviets left, leaving behind, actually, a pretty effective Afghan national army then. But that was, of course, a recipe just for the civil war to go on and on and on. Yeah, and is it is it in fact is it a, a priority? Should should it be a priority of a U.S. government, a U.S. administration, to stop a Taliban government from taking power? Sorry, I'm, I'm faded. For it's, a okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's <laughs> okay. Anatole, I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> Should it? Should, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, I've, I've, I've got it. Okay. Um, I don't think that a Taliban government will, in any circumstances, be able to take power again over the whole of Afghanistan, or even most likely Kabul. Because if you remember the 1990s, the Taliban had a real... They, they swept the Pashtun areas very easily. After that, they had a real fight on their hands when it came to conquering the non-Pashtun areas and even Kabul to a degree. Now that's when they only had a weak Russia and Iran against them. This time, they will have Russia, a much stronger Russia, they will have India, and they will have the United States. Now, I, I mean, unless the former Northern Alliance are made up of complete, hopeless idiots, given that level of backing, I, I, I simply can't imagine that they won't be able to defend their own areas against the Taliban. So what you're looking at, at most, in my view, is the Taliban 
controlling most of the Pashtun areas, and then with a share of government in Kabul. Now, would that satisfy them? Once again, we won't know till we've explored it. It is interesting, though, that the, the Pakistani military, I think, have themselves recognised uh, that uh, you know, they're, they're not going to get a united Afghanistan under Taliban rule. And indeed, I'm not sure, actually, that most of them even want it, because when they got that in the 1990s, to put it mildly, it didn't work out to Pakistan's advantage. So that, in addition, I think you will have pressure from the Pakistani military on the Taliban to accept a halfway reasonable deal. Um, so I think, I'm not saying it will happen, but I think it's worth exploring, put, put it at that. Okay. Anatole, show us your book once more. Pakistan, Anatole Levin's new book. Buy it. Buy it today. Thanks very much, Anatole. Thanks a lot. Okay.